Amen. I hope you brought a notebook today and a pen, or I hope you have um, a, 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 like a notes app on your phone, and we're just going to be spitting stuff at you, and, and today is going to be less preaching, and, and it's going to feel more like a living room, okay? Here's what I know is that wherever you are at today, whether you are married, whether you are in a relationship, whether you're in a situationship, or you are single, I believe that God has something yeah. for anybody who is hungry enough to eat what he puts in front of them, right. okay? How many of you, you are like the eater that like it don't matter what's in front of you, you're going to eat it? Okay, I believe that today God is going to prepare a table uh, of, of, of his finest dining and, and he is making it available to anybody who would receive it. And so here's what I want to ask you today. Open your hearts uh, to receive all that he has for you. Me and my wife, we have been married now for six years. We just celebrated our six year anniversary going on seven. Yeah, yeah. And I would say it's been the best six years of our entire life. Yes. Like if I could live back any six-year period of my life, it would be back to our wedding day when we were in Minnesota. Uh, we got married in Minnesota because we met in Minnesota. Yep. And we went, and it was freezing. It was like negative how, degrees. How cold? Negative yeah. what? It was like negative three. Mm -hmm. It was like negative And whatever. I thought we were getting married in the summer, y'all, okay? He's like, how quick can we plan this wedding? I had yeah. like a tank top dress on and everything. It was freezing. Yeah, it was freezing. And it's funny because like I'm in like a tux with a coat and she's like not. <laughs> and in all of our pictures, she looks freezing. Um, but but I remember our, our wedding, it was like the best day of our lives. And, and, and not only have we been married for six years, but we've been best friends for 10 years. And so we're looking forward to... Um, uh, living uh, with each other longer than um, we've lived without each other. Um, and, and that is the goal. That is the mission. How many of you know that is the mission yes. of marriage, right? Is to quite literally live happily ever after. And, and we talked about it last week. Um, we want to shed light. We want to shed truth. We want to shed God's word on every single relationship that you have in your life. Not even just romantic, not even just intimate relationships, uh, but, but whether you are messed up or jacked up, come on somebody, um, or you have it all together, I believe that God has something for every single person in the room today. And we're excited to embark on this adventure of relationships. God's design for us was to be in relationship, not just with one another spouse-wise, but also friendships and, and people and gathering. Um, and it's why we gather with the church. He says, don't forsake the gathering uh, of people. And, and so uh, I believe this, that, that, that God wants us to first, before we can enter into a godly relationship, before we can enter into all that he has for us, is to do this, is to count the cost of what we are embarking on. Yeah. We have to count the cost. Mm -hmm. What? What, what is the cost that we are paying? There's some costs that we want to talk about that relationships have. I love what it says in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, and this is going to be the foundation of where we are at today. It says this, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you are not able to finish it, Everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, the person began it, but he wasn't able to finish it. He started the work, but he wasn't able to finish the work. Our heart for you is not that you would build something, but that you would finish what you started building. Right? It's not that you would be in a great relationship. It's that you would run the race all the way to the end. At the end of the race, say, man, I have no regrets. I have no flaw. Man, I, 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 I set out to do what I said I was going to set out to do, and I accomplished the mission. Why? Because I counted the cost. I think that tonight, for some of us, it's time for us to count the cost. Yeah. Have you counted the cost in your dating life? Have you counted the cost in your search, in your pursuit for a spouse? Have you counted the cost in your friendships? Tonight, the title, if you're writing this, uh, taking notes today, and you should be, um, it, it is simply this, Bay on a Budget. Okay? Bay on a Budget. Okay, we, we want to help save some time, some energy, some of your mind, some of your stress, and get you on a budget. 
Yep. Anybody here, you're a little bit impulsive. Anybody here, you're a little bit impulsive. I'm impul- I'm not even going to lie. I am impulsive. Impulsive. Okay? <laughs> Me and my wife, we, uh, we, we, we just celebrated six years, and I wanted to buy her something that she really wanted. And so I was like, man, she has always wanted a hot tub. She's like a hot tub girl. She loves her hot tub. She loves taking baths. And so I was like, bro, I'm going to go buy her a hot tub. So I found a hot tub for a steal of a deal. And, and we go and we, we buy this hot tub. We move it into our house. I'm like, babe, surprise. She's like, oh, my gosh, this is the best thing ever. And, and the issue with the hot tub is that a hot tub ain't just like a, a, a normal, like, plug-in, right? Like, you have to have a, a very specific higher voltage plug-in outlet receiver for this hot tub. And so I started doing some research trying to get an electrician out to my house to 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 uh, run some wiring so that we could operate this hot tub and and the first electrician came and he quoted me four times the cost of what I paid for the hot tub <laughs> and I was like yo and, and and ain't it funny like when you have like contractors out and you, you're just trying to keep a straight face and you're like oh okay yeah yeah that's that sounds great yeah we'll yeah. be in contact you know, yeah no that's that sounds good and he's like when do you want to do it I was like oh you know what man let me let me just talk to my wife and I'm, I'm sure we'll do it you know you have no intention of doing it you know I'm like having this conversation I'm like yo bro like dog we wasted ten minutes dog like I, I gotta go to the, the next guy he quoted me five times the price of this hot tub and then I had a third guy come out and it was the same as the first guy. I realized, wow, I did not think this through all the way. (laughs) And so now we have this inoperable hot tub in the Mm -hmm. back of our backyard (laughs) that we can't move because it is way too heavy. Um, and we have to pay somebody to get it out. And, and so now it's funny because we have this hot tub and, and we have something that we thought was going to be really good for us. But now we are actually living in a very large deficit. Because I paid the price for the hot tub. I don't want to pay the price for the electrical. And now I am paying to have this thing removed. And I'm actually trying to sell this thing. Yep. Because for us, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. But if I would have known how much the electrical would have cost, I never would have purchased the hot tub in the first place. Right. <laughs> and now I'm living in the deficit. Now I'm living in the debt. Now I'm living under what I thought was supposed to take me over. Ain't it funny that maybe you didn't buy a hot tub, but a lot of us, we buy relationships the same way. Where we start them, not counting the cost, not calculating everything that might have to go into this thing. Only for us to have this relationship, realizing, whoa, how in the world did I even get here? And now we're living in deficit. What is the deficit? The deficit is heartbreak. The deficit is lowered expectations. The deficit is a projection of pain. Well, because that that ex-boyfriend did that to me, now I look at every single man like that. Because that ex-girlfriend did that to me, now I look at every girl like that. And now we're living in the deficit. Why? Because we didn't first count the cost. Today I want to help us count the cost. Studies show this, that 50% of all marriages in the United States will end in divorce or separation. That means that one out of every two of you in this room eventually will be divorced or separated. Our assignment is to change that statistic in this room so that you can have a thriving, living, breathing, God-ordained marriage in your life. But this is even even, uh, more staggering. Researchers estimate that 41% of all first marriages end in divorce. Okay? Now check this out. 60% of all second marriages end in divorce. Now watch this. 73% of all third marriages end in divorce. What, what does this show me? It shows me that it only gets easier to live in debt and deficit yeah. when you don't do it the right way. Yeah. Right? Th- these are just the, the statistics. It has nothing to do with connection and has everything to do with the cost. And, and we live our relationships a lot based on connection, forsaking the cost. And so, so for a few moments today, we just want to talk to you, and we want to get all of you on a budget. <laughs> we want to get your bay on a budget, all right? Not so that you can live a cheap life, but so that you can live a lasting life. So that by the end of your building, you can look back and you can say, come hell or high water, come wind, rain, storm, whatever the devil might bring, we are built to last. 
Yeah. We're built to last today. And so, so, so what does this cost? We have a few costs that we want to break down for you. We want to break down your relationships um, tonight, and, and, and we're going we're gonna to start right now. Yeah, so we've got four different costs that we want to talk to with you guys about. And the first one is the cost of singleness. The cost of singleness. Here is my hot take, okay? I believe there are more single Christians in the church than God meant for there to be. Okay, I believe there are more single people in the church than God wants in the church. Why do I say that? Because his command in Genesis 128 is literally to be fruitful and to multiply. Here is the issue. All y'all want to multiply, okay, before we are getting ourselves right with God, okay? And so here's what's happening. Here's what's happening, okay? The cost of singleness. <clears throat> There are too many people that are not concerned with getting themselves right, and so they're not making it to the point that God has commanded. It's a struggle to get to the place that God has commanded. We have used this excuse that dating in 2024 is impossible, okay? Now, I haven't done it, so I do see your struggle, okay? But here's what I'm saying is that we've used this excuse, and we've said, you know what? It's just not the same as it used to be. It's not the same as finding a good God Godly woman or a good godly man and being able to go out and just build this relationship. Like people aren't the same anymore. We've used the analogy that love is not built like it used to be, right? Things have gotten crazy, but we have hidden behind our icks. We've hidden behind our red flags. We've hidden behind trauma. We've hidden behind our emotional immaturity for a really long time. And instead of investing into ourselves in our single seasons to get ourselves healthy and to get ourselves well, we just continue to hide. And because of that, we're never reaching what God has commanded for each and every one of us. We have a lot of unhealthy marriages. He just scared, shared some scary statistics, right? Those are unhealthy marriages because the reality is we have a lot of unhealthy individuals. We have a whole bunch of people that jump into it because here's the deal. In the singleness, we are looking to find. We're looking to find the people that knock off our list. We're looking to find all these different things when really the cost of singleness is the cost of you becoming what God has always intended and created you to be. People always say in the first two years of marriage that it's the hardest years of marriage of your life. Why is that? It's because once we get into marriages, we recognize that there are some unhealthy tendencies that I have developed, and because I did not deal with them while I was single, I am now facing them in my marriage, and now they're destroying my marriage. I wanna share something with you. What you do not confront in your singleness will continue onto your relationships. What you do not confront, it will continue in your life. Let's talk about your finances, okay? Let's talk about your, fi how, oh, I don't know, that one was like, oh, oh, all right. How are you with your finances? Are your finances in a stable place to be able to support just you, right? Or are you living this paycheck to paycheck life? Do you tithe? Have you put yourself, have you put your money back into God's hands and say, God, I recognize the only way that I can get this on track is if I give it back to you first. How are your finances? How are you emotionally, okay? How is the mental health? How well do you communicate? It is important as a single person to learn how to communicate. It is important for you to figure out what triggers you as a single person. Because how you communicate now will dictate what you take into your marriage and into your future. And there is some unhealth in a lot of our communication styles, if we're being honest. If you cannot have a disagreement without raising your voice, without leaving, or without running your mouth, guess what? If you don't confront it, it will continue. If you don't confront it, it will continue. So how strong are you when it comes to your spiritual life? How do you spend time with God outside of this place? Because if it's not a habit that is established, guess what? It's not just going to appear overnight. It happens in your single season. This singleness, it is significant. It is significant because it's important to get all of these things in order now. Your finances, your priorities, learning how to communicate, 
discovering what values you want to have in your family one day, this is your time to be selfish. Selfish to get well. Your single season should be a time where you say, let me reflect everything about me, the way that I act, the way that I think, the way that I feel, and let me get healthy right now. I was reading this Instagram post earlier today and it said that deconstruction is part of the foundation. Deconstructing every part about you is a part of making yourself in a place where you are ready to be in the relationship that God has designed for you. It's your time to start becoming the person that you're looking for, and that person is looking for you at the same time. You'll be married double, triple, quadruple the amount of time that you were single in your life, right? So what are you doing with that? You've got to focus on the beginning stages. You've got to focus on the parts that you can control, and that is yourself. Focus on yourself. Don't sit idle in your singleness. Your singleness is a time to solidify everything in you? Do I have a solid foundation? Am I emotionally ready for this? Am I spiritually ready for this? Am I ready to go into this next place? It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 34, it says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married but, or has never been married can devote to the Lord in holy and body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. When I read this, it became so clear to me. My attention is divided. Right now in your single season, you will never have more undivided attention to God. No more, never have more undivided attention to your calling. Never have more undivided attention to serving in your church. This is your time to be more committed to God and to your calling than it is to a person. Because just as the scripture said, my commitments, they have to change when I step into my godly relationship. I go from being just committed to God just committed to the calling that I have to pastor to now bring in my husband into this equation. And now my interest and my time and my commitments, they are divided. Yes, it's still God first, but then my ministry to my husband and then my ministry to people. As I become a mother, there's another element that is thrown into that. You will never have more time than you have right now to become the person that God has made you to be. You will never have more time to alter those things. Your singleness is sacred. It's a sacred time to say, God, what is this? Who am I supposed to be and where do I go from here? Good, tell your neighbor, your singleness is sacred. Your singleness is sacred. Like she said, you will never have more time than you have right now. And that's not us saying that you're not busy because you have job, right. you have education, right. you have all these things. What we're saying is it's different when you have a three-year-old child waking up every day at 3 a.m. in the morning, coming into your room, waking you up. All of a sudden, it's different when you didn't have that responsibility, right? Serving is different. When you're single... Dude, you can stay out till 2 a.m. in the morning serving God. I lived in the church. When, 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 you're, when you're married, all of a sudden, it, it begins to change. It's not better or worse. It's just different. different. Mm -hmm. And there's a special priority that God places on your singleness. Number two, the cost of singleness. Number two, the cost of completion. The cost of completion. You, you ever heard the saying, you complete me? You ever said the saying, you complete me? <laughs> Maybe when you were younger, some of you said it before you came in, when that cute girl that you met outside, you're like, oh my gosh, God told me to tell you, you complete me. <laughs> it was weird. Um, I know mean, that is the biggest lie ever told when it comes to relationships. Uh, the purpose of relationships is not completion. <laughs> the purpose of relationships is not completion. Some of you, y'all you, 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 need to come back next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about sex. <laughs> the, 
The purpose of relationships is not completion in every sense that you might be thinking it. My wife does not complete me. The only person on the planet that can complete me is God and God himself. Now listen, listen, listen. In all of us, we have this void in all of us. There is a void in every single one of us. It is why you came to church tonight. It is why you got saved. It is why you hit rock bottom and realized I have literally tried everything and nothing else can fulfill me. There is a void. It happened in the garden when Eve and Adam, they ate the fruit. All of a sudden, there was a void that took place before they were complete, after they had a void. The only person on the planet, the only thing on the, that can fill that void is Jesus Christ himself. It's why we call him the bridge. He was the bridge that came down in the form of a man to connect us back to God, to fill the deep cavity that every human on earth has. It's why we preach it. It's why we'll preach it until we die and go back to heaven, that God is the one that fills the void. He's the only person that can complete us. This is the cost of completion, that if you want to be complete, you have to find it not in any person, Person, but in the person of Jesus Christ. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, and in him, and only him, you have been made complete. Come on, anybody thankful today that you don't need a man, come on, to be complete. You don't need a woman to be complete. Boo-boo, you are already complete right now. All you got to do is call in the name of the Lord. And he says, hey, I will make you a new creation. I will make you a complete creation. And he is the head over every ruler and authority. Did you know that broken plus broken equals more broken? <laughs> and it's funny how human math says broken plus broken equals whole. Man, if I can just, dude, I'm so depressed right now. I'm so discouraged right now. Man, I, I don't have vision from my life. Man, my bank account is broke. Man, if I can just find a sugar daddy, if I can just find a sugar mama, man, then, then my broke plus their broke, man, we're going to be whole. We're going to be happy. We're going to be healthy. No, no, no. Broke plus broke equals more broke. <laughs> more broke. But whole plus whole equals multiplication. It equals, multi you know what the Bible says? The Bible says one can send a thousand to flight, two can send 10,000 to flight. In other words, it's not the principle of addition. It's the principle of multiplication, right? See, my job as a husband to my wife is not to complete my wife. My wife's job to me is not to complete me. As a matter of fact, it's my job as a husband to show up complete yeah. so that yep. I don't complete her, but I do compliment her. Yeah. Okay, listen, listen. My job in, in, in my relationships is not to complete anybody. Only God can complete. My job in any relationship that I have on this earth is to compliment them. What, what do I mean, what do I mean by this word, this word compliment? Um, I, I, I think, I think this principle of, of completion is so important because um, anybody here, you want to be more like Jesus. Come on, how many of you, you want to look like Jesus, you want to talk like Jesus, you want to be like Jesus. Are you okay being single like Jesus? Newsflash, Jesus never had a bay. Did you know that? Some of you complaining about being single at 25. He was single at 33, hanging on a cross, and not even his girlfriend was there to support him. Because <laughs> he didn't have a girlfriend. I want to be like Jesus. Jesus is like, I was single. <laughs> I, I was single. He was proof. He was proof that completeness only comes from one relationship. He was proof. He was living, breathing proof that completeness only came from one relationship, and that was between him and God. Therefore, what do we do? We compliment each other. Anybody had, had, a, had a steak before? You ever eaten a steak before? A steak? You ever had a steak? Man, I, I, love, I love eating steak, man. Steak, right? What do you do on a steak? You, you add seasoning to a steak, and you salt that steak up. 
right? You throw as much salt as you, uh, uh, like, as, uh, like that's the amount of salt that I throw on my steak, it could kill me tomorrow. That's how much salt I can. Oh Why? Because the salt does not complete the steak, but it does complement the steak. What, what do I mean by complement? It means to pull out the flavor. It means to pull out everything that's inside. See, that is my job as a husband, to pull out everything inside of my wife that is in her. I don't complete her, but I can pull out her courage. I can pull out her bravery. I can pull out a new mindset. I can, I can pull it. And in the same way, she pulls it out of me. Can I tell you, I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate preaching without my wife in the room. Why? Because she pulls out the best preacher in me. She, she pulls it out of me. So I don't like when she's not in the room. I tell her all the time, I'm like, babe, I need you in the room when I preach. Why? Because she adds, a, she pulls out a new level inside of me. Watch this, watch this. She is a great mom because of me. It's the truth. No, he's not. No, you, you're a great woman on your own. You're a strong, independent. You don't need that man. You don't need it. No, no, you can do it. All. You can, you can, you can parent those kids on. You gave birth to the, he ain't give birth to the, no, no, you can do it. All. No, 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 no. She is a great mom because of me. And, and watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. I am a great follower of Jesus because of her. <laughs> She's a great leader because of me. I'm a great pastor because of her. Why? Because we are pulling the best out of each other. Watch this. I know you shouldn't be dating somebody. I know you should have maybe waited a little bit before you got married to somebody. If all you do is pull out the worst in each other. <laughs> that ain't no relationship, dog. <laughs> That's stress. <laughs> Man. You ever seen a couple, all they do is pull out the worst in each other. That's like, it's like, bro, all you do is get mad in their presence. All you do are grumpy when they're around. Like you are a worse mom because of them. You are a worse follower of Jesus because of them. Right? The person that you are designed to be with is going to pull out all of the flavor, all of the potential, all of the calling. You see, this is why, this is why, this is why. When my wife gets invited to preach places, I have two options. I can get mad and angry. Whoa, I don't know. Why didn't they invite me to preach? I don't, <laughs> I think I'm a better preacher than her. I don't, why, why would they, why would they invite her and they didn't even ask me? Or, like a God-ordained spouse that he has created me to be, I can look at her and I'll say, are you kidding me? It's about time that they called you to preach. Are you kidding? Girl, you about to slay. Girl, you about to get up there. A hundred people about to get saved. Girl, God's about to anoint your mouth with fire. All of a sudden, I become her greatest cheerleader. Did you know that in your relationship, your design by God is to be their greatest cheerleader? Come on, baby. You got this. Come on. We going to do this thing together. Come on. Well, how do I know? How do I know? Because the Bible says that Adam created Eve as a helper as a helper, as a helper. He said, he said, it's not good for man to be alone, but I'm going to design a helper. Genesis cha chapter two, verses 18. I will make a helper suitable for him. Why? Because within the framework, it alludes that man needs woman and woman needs man to be complete. This is not what is happening, though a lot of times we read this and we're like, yeah, man, man is stupid. They need women. <laughs> women, they, they're crazy. They need men. No, that's not what it's talking about. This, this word helper, this word helper, it, 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 is, it is translated in the Hebrew to azar, E-Z-E-R. Azar, and it is used 21 times in the Old Testament. Um, in, in the book of Man and Woman, uh, one, uh, uh, one in Christ, this is the book title, Philip Payne, the author, he says it this way, the noun used here, Azar, throughout the Old Testament does not suggest helper as in servant, okay? I thought more women would get excited about that. Come on, somebody. <laughs> like, no, no, it's not, it's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about a lesser than partner. It's not talking about a servant. It's not talking about somebody who does the things that you don't want to do. As a matter of fact, okay, 
this translation used 21 times was used to describe a help, a savior, a rescuer, a protector, as in God, our helper, right? And no other occurrence in the Old Testament does it refer to as in an inferior position, but always as a superior position or an equal position. Help expresses that the woman is the help. The woman is the strength. The woman is the rescue. The woman is the saving of the man to say, hey, I'm going to pull you up to higher levels as you pull me up to higher levels. Okay, my job, I don't complete my wife, but I do compliment my wife to pull the best out of. Just like that salt with that steak. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, if your relationships stop getting salty, and I'm not talking about the offendedness, I'm talking about th this, this godly type of salt. When they lose its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot, right? Do you pull the best out of that person or do you pull the worst out of that person? Are you complete? Are you complete? Let me ask you this question. Are you the person that the person you dream of dreams of? Are you the person that the person that you dream of, dreams of. Because you can't compliment anything until you're complete. Yeah. The cost of singleness, the cost of completion. Here's a third one, the cost of connection. Yeah. Okay, the cost of connection. Here's another good question. What is the standard by which <laughs> you are pursuing someone? What is the standard that you are, by which you are pursuing someone? Yeah. There is a standard that God has called us under. When you call yourself a Christian, there's a standard that you adopt in your own life. It's called holiness. It's called righteousness. It's called consecrated. It's called set apart. Did you know that in 2024, Christian is not good enough? I think one of the most commonly recited standards that people use is Hey, what, what's your standard? Like, I want a man of God. I want a woman of God. I want a devoted Christian. What does that even mean in 2024? Because if I can be honest, I meet people all the time, and they're like, hey, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I'm a pastor. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Oh, no way, dude. What church do you go to? Um, oh man, what's that church called? Oh, dude, I just went there on Easter. Hang on. What was it? I, it was the, it was the, it was the, uh, oh yeah, it was, is that, it's that church down the street. You don't even know the name of your church? And you're a Christian? Like, I can, I can, I can probably go on many people who identify as Christians Instagram and pretty quickly realize I don't think that they actually know what they identify with. <laughs> because if they knew what they identified with, the standard of what they presented in every single area of their life would align with God's word <laughs> and not contradict it. <laughs> Guys, I hate to break it to you. I, I, had, a, I had a buddy who, who, who said on, on Instagram the other day, they're like, man, God, man, God is not black and white. He's, he, he's, he's gray in a lot of areas. That's why you got to know him. I don't know what Bible you read, but my Bible is pretty black and white. <laughs> like, occasional a few red letters. <laughs> but for the most part, <laughs> it's pretty black and white. <laughs> and, so, and so it's not good enough to say, well, the standard is a man of God. <laughs> I see a lot of man of God that are man of God on the outside, <laughs> but, <laughs> but man of a whole lot of other stuff on the inside. <laughs> And I ain't even got to hang out with them a lot. <laughs> and I can say the same thing for women. Yeah. And, so, and so what I'm saying is it's, it's, not, it's not just about, it's not just about it, the connection, but it's about the standard. What is the standard? The standard by which we 
live. Why? Because write this down. You will rise or fall to the level of the relationships that you have in your life. You will rise or fall to the level of the relationships that you have in your life. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Show me the person that you're dating. Unfortunately, I will show you your future. Or the opposite. Fortunately, I will show you your future. You see, I, I love it because me and Wit, when we started first dating, Wit was like a prize, y'all. She was like a prize. Everybody wanted this girl. Like, like she was like the goody two shoes. And like in Christian college, you know, like you look for that one girl who loves the Lord but is also cute. You know, sometimes that can be difficult. Uh, Babe. I'm saying? That's too far. You know, that was too far. That was too, too All right, Back far. up, back up. There's a whole lot of beautiful people in the room. It was a joke, okay? It would have been offensive if everybody was in ugly in this room, but you're not ugly. Only a few of you are. Okay, so. <laughs> but God loves ugly people too, okay? <laughs> no, but honestly, God, Wit was the prize. She was the prize. Everybody, everybody wanted her. And when, and when I got with Wit, they were like, how in the world did you get with wit? <laughs> like, dog, you ain't got no business being with somebody like that. But, but here's what I understood. I, I understood. I will rise or fall to the level of the people that I pursue. Right? And so that's why it matters. Today we want to give you four C's. We want to give you four C's. We're calling these the four C's of connection. The four C's. The four standards God wants us to live by. Go ahead. Compatibility. Okay? Are you compatible? <clears throat> there are a lot of people that are dating because it makes sense to them. Or like you've been in this friendship for a little bit and you're just like, yeah, I mean, this is like naturally the next step is that we would, you know, be together. Or maybe you've invested so much time that it feels like, man, I just can't stop now. Like we've already been through so much and it, it, I can't imagine going through this with anybody else. Time and logic are not compatibility. Okay, time and logic are not compatibility. Compatibility means you enjoy the same things. Like you enjoy talking to each other. You enjoy the same idea of a good night out, of a good date night, of you and value the same things. You work well together. You can communicate. And I think that there's a lot of people that are together just because it feels right or it feels natural. And I can tell you that your feelings lie to you. Your feelings will make you think something is supposed to be when really feelings just lead you astray. And here's the deal is that compatibility and chemistry, they go hand in hand. I believe that the Holy Spirit, he works through chemistry. Just like the Holy Spirit in your life, attraction is not chemistry because attraction Attraction, it can fade over time. Uh, there's a lot of things that I have been through with Pastor Darrison, and can I tell you, like, I am not what I, I do not look the way that I used to when we first started dating, okay? Life has happened. Marriage happened, okay? Anybody dating someone, you know, you gain some weight when you start eating out good all the time, okay? And I can just remember that I am not what I used to be when I first met him. He is not what he used to be when I first met him. I am so glad that our fashion styles, they have elevated, amen, okay? And I just look back and there's been so many seasons of life that I have walked through with him. And it would be really easy for me to say, hey, you know, things changed. I fell in love with who you used to be, but now we're charting new territory and I don't really know if like we're still compatible. Here's the thing is that chemistry and the Holy Spirit, they go hand in hand. Just as you you grow close together and as you evolve and as God continues to change you and work in your life, guess what? That connection with each other will naturally grow stronger if it is from God. When it's of God, you do not have to force things. When it's of God, the feelings don't fade. When it's of God, you just continue to fight for each other each season, each day. I loved him as a single guy. I loved him as my friend. I loved him as an engaged couple. I loved him as my husband. And then I loved him as a father. I loved him in every single season. And every single season looked different. But there was still this compatibility. There was still this, this connection, this, this desire, this thing that, hey, we're going to work it out. We're going to find each other. We're going to choose each other. And we're going to fight for each other through it all. Because at the end of the day, this is what God has made for us. And because God did it, we don't have to force it. We don't have to force it. Good. And I think, too, attraction versus chemistry. Attraction says through thin but maybe not thick. Right? You ever heard that? Through, through life, but maybe not death, right? Because there will be a day when, a tr when, when things change, things change. I'm, when, we were, when we were single and just friends, 
Then all of a sudden things changed and we started talking. And then all of a sudden things changed and we were engaged. And then all of a sudden things changed, right? Attraction doesn't like the change. Yeah. Attractions likes the, the way that it used to be. Yeah. What happens when, when, when you're with your partner for, for, for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and all of a sudden the sex doesn't feel like what it did when you were doing it before you were married? People are like, oh, snap, we talking about that now, <laughs> right? It changes. Guess what? Guess what? It's, it's all puppy dog, man. When the makeup is caked on and you got the three-piece suit and you're going out on that first date, and, and there's, there's lit, like, bro, you, you went and you sprayed that thing. <laughs> you got 20 pieces of gum in your <laughs> Right, right. All of a sudden, you're married for five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, and all of a sudden, you roll over and you're like, dang, girl, you gotta brush those teeth. <laughs> dang, boy, you got that crust in your eyes. You got that snot running down your nose. All of a sudden, the, the, the physical picture yeah. gets a whole lot less sexy. Yeah. But when it's not built on attraction, but it's built on compatibility and chemistry. Girl, I just want to tell you, you are 10 times sexier than the first time that I met you, that I laid eyes on you. <laughs> and it's not even because the way she looks. It's not even because of what I see, but it's the chemistry that I feel. That man, I remember when we climbed the highest mountain and we stood on the tallest mountain, but I also remember when we walked through the lowest valley and nobody else was there, but you were still holding my hand and you were still shooting me text messages saying, hey, babe, I'm going to be here when you get home from work and we're going to ride this thing out together. The second C is character. 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 Are you the same person that you are behind closed doors that you are in public? Are they? Are they? Attraction will bring you together. Character will keep you together. Yeah. Great character. You can write this down. Character will call you and everyone around you higher. Yeah. You ever been around someone with great character? All of a sudden, you're like, hey, yo, who wants to hit this blunt? Oh, no, hey, hold up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know you were here. That's my bad. <laughs> my bad, my bad. You, you, ever, you ever been around somebody or, 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 or all of a sudden you, you and your boy, you're, you're talking, you're, man, you're cussing up a storm and then, and then that person walks into the room and you're like, oh, hey, yo, everybody chill, everybody chill. Bro, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I swore, man. I, I know that's not your thing, man, I, right? Great character, character. But, but write this down. Poor character will drag you and everyone around you lower. <laughs> it, it, it will do the exact same. A good test of character is someone who doesn't need to speak at all because their actions say everything that they need to say. I knew what Pastor Witt stood for before we even started dating because I could see it in the way she lived. I could see it when she would step into rooms and all of a sudden people would puff up their chest and say, oh man, we gotta act different because Witt's in the room, right? And I was like, man, dude, that, there's something so attractive about that, that not only is she attractive physic, but there is a character that is keeping her. There is a character that is going to not just sustain her, but also sustain me when I feel like compromising my character, right? Do you have people in your life that call you to keep your character or call you to compromise your character? Like, 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 is there a dude in your life that is just constantly, bro, let me see you naked, bro, let me see you naked, bro, let me see you naked. <laughs> but the character of Christ says that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you see, there ain't nothing sexier than a man that will say, hey man, you know what? I'm saving myself for marriage. Like, I, I don't mean to take us back to the 90s, purity and sanctification and holiness, but I just feel like in 2024, we got to get back to purity, sanctification, yep. and holiness, yeah. and we got to start to realize that virginity wasn't like this 
man created, fabricated, oh, you're, no, no. It, this, wasn't a it was God's design. Can yeah. I tell you, there is nothing like sex when it's done God's way. Yep. Oh my goodness, there ain't nothing like sex. I'm getting ahead of myself because we're talking about sex. We're going there next week. But I'm just, I'm just saying, there is nothing like having sex. I'll say it again next week, but I got to say it tonight because I'm talking about character. There is nothing like having sex and saying, Holy Spirit, you can watch us. You can be in the room. And I have no conviction after it. <laughs> there ain't no conviction. There, there ain't no like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad. It's like, ah, 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 did you see that baby? Ah. Ain't nobody else gonna say it in church. I'm just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's just the truth, it's just the truth. It's just the truth. Instead of being like, <laughs> I'm just saying, character, man. Character. That's what I'm talking about, character. Yeah. The third C is convictions, okay? <laughs> Conviction, what, y'all wanted to stay on that a little longer or what? I'm not just kidding, okay. Convictions, okay? Has the Lord convicted you about the same things? Are the non-negotiables in your life the same as the non-negotiables as the person that you are pursuing, okay? Where is the line drawn? Where are your convictions? Is it the same for your significant other? Okay, something that was a conviction for me was drinking, okay? I know it's not a sin to drink, okay? But I, a conviction of mine was that I never wanted to drink. I knew that the calling that God had in my life was to be set apart. And for me, I didn't want to be a stumbling block for anybody that might struggle with drinking and struggle to control those different things. But also, I never wanted to be under the influence of anything other than the Holy Spirit, I didn't want to mess with the line or play with fire. And for me, there were relationships in my life that had to end, people that I was dating, people that were pursuing me, because our convictions did not line up. They're like, come on, just a glass of wine. But I knew my conviction. And as hard as it was, and as many tears as I cried to end things that were not the same when it came to the non-negotiables, when it were not the same for what God had spoken to me, guess what? I saved myself years of pain. I saved myself years of compromise. I saved myself years of hard conversations. I saved myself years of doubting. God, did I make the right choice? God, am I in the right place? Is this person actually the person that you created for me? Because God, we don't even agree on the same things that you spoke to me it's the conviction breaking off a relationship because your convictions the things that God had spoken that's just one there's so many convictions your convictions to go to church weekly okay that is not that's not even conviction that's bible okay so i'm gonna let you take that okay to be in godly community and to be in those different things but there are different convictions the convictions when it comes to what does your bachelor or your bachelorette party look like on your last night of freedom it might not be a conversation you think of, but then you get to the point where you've already said yes. You've already said, hey, I want to get engaged. Like, yeah, let's do this thing. You start planning and you start to find out, hey, my, the person thinks that it's acceptable to have a stripper there. But a conviction for me is no, that's not how I'm going to live my last night of singleness, right? And that wasn't Pastor Darison. But I'm saying these are the things, right? Where your convictions, it wasn't him because we made it, amen? Okay, here's the thing. Your convictions, they have to line up. The tough conversations have to happen before you say yes. 
They have to happen because what God has spoken was never meant to change. And where we get so lost is we let the enemy alter things. We let the enemy water down things that God has spoken to us. And I want to say the years of tears, questions of, of fights that are continue to go unresolved because your convictions were unmatched. Good, good conviction. Is this good for anybody today? I hope you're enjoying it. We just got a few more. We got a few more. The last C, the last C, the four C's, this last one is calling. 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 This one, this one is the most, hands down, this is the most overlooked C in relationships. The most overlooked because maybe you are compatible. Maybe you do have strong convictions. Maybe you are the truest sense of a man of God, a woman of God, right? Maybe you do have strong standards. But do your callings align? There is no greater purpose in this earth than to fulfill the call that God has for you. The call. So, so how is your calling? Question, are you running the same race, number one, but number two, are you running the same pace? The same race, the same pace. Fulfilling God's plan for your life means never forsaking the calling for the sake of a connection. In Genesis, we see this story of Lot and his wife, and they're given specific instructions. They're called by God to flee the city and to not turn back and look back at the city. Lot ran. His wife had a different call. And she looked back. And what happened is that she became a pillar of salt. And later, Lot had to deal with incest within his own family because he didn't have his partner who was called to the same thing that he was called to. And now he was living in a life that was much harder to live because he wasn't running the same race and he wasn't running the same pace. When two people have two different visions... It is called die vision. Division. <laughs> For anyone that missed that. Two visions. Die vision. In other words, death to one vision. Does the person you're pursuing have the same vision? doesn't matter if they're a Christian. doesn't matter if they tie. doesn't matter if they go to church. doesn't matter if they're... Do they have the same vision? Why? Because alignment determines assignment. Yeah. And you will elevate your assignment if you are in alignment, not just with what God has told you, but with the person that you are running the race with. Right. Right. Listen, if you are called to ministry, dog, you better find somebody who is called to ministry. Because if my wife was not called to ministry, every time that I was out with people, every time that I was meeting with people, every time that I was discipling people, she'd get irritated. Why you always got to be at church? Dude, I get that you're called there, but I ain't called there. Can you get, ho can you get home? You're coming home at 12 o'clock at night every single night going to this rally thing. You don't get home till 12 o'clock at night. Dude, I... I'm in bed by 10. I don't even get to kiss you goodnight. Listen, if you are called to build something, you better make sure that they're called to build. <laughs> because when you ask them to pick up a hammer and they get offended, like, bro, what did I, I didn't sign up for this. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna be called to, then you better find somebody who's called to, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be called to people, you better, you better date a people person. <laughs> Because they're going to get irritated every single time. If, she, if she's not a people person, but I'm a people person, I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, yeah, dude, let, let's, let's, let's come over. Hey, why don't you guys come over to my house? Let's, do, let's have a game night at my house. And she's like, I hate people. I don't want people in my house. I don't want them to clean every night. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You, you better find somebody who is chasing the same vision that God has given you. This is the, the four C's. you got to count the cost. Count the cost. 
This is the last cost that we want to talk about today, and it's the cost of desire. The cost of desire. And listen, this is what we want to tell you today. Don't let your desires destroy you. Don't let your desires destroy the house before you even built it. Don't let your desire for a hot tub (laughs) make you regret desiring a hot tub (laughs) because you were so infatuated with the hot tub that you forgot to count the cost of everything else that came partnered with the hot tub. (laughs) Adam and Eve, it was the desire in the garden that clouded their greater judgment. It's our desire that gets us in the most trouble. And the problem with desire is that we innately desire things that are no good for us. Did you know that? The things that we desire, most of them are not good for us. Most of them God doesn't desire for us. My daughter desires to marry a boy in her class. Don't say his name like that. As if you're cheering him on. He didn't. Can I testify? The other day we asked my daughter if she was still dating. She said, no, I broke up with him. I said, praise God. There's a God who lives. There's a God who breathes. There's a God who still does miracles. (laughs) So you can stop saying his name. (laughs) Bad desires the reason Eve ate the fruit. I love what it says in Romans chapter 7. Some of you need to write this down and remember this the next time you're desiring something. It says this, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That's good on its own right there. Good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good but I can't carry it out. For I don't do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep doing. Anybody ever felt that before? You're like, dude, there's so much good that I want to do, but I can't do it. There's so many cycles that I want to break, but I can't break them. There's so many reasons that I want to change, but I can't change it. And and for some reason, the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing. The guys I know I shouldn't date, I keep dating. The girls I keep pursuing that I know I shouldn't be pursuing, I I keep on doing. Why? Why? I keep doing this thing, verse 20. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my Inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law on my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. There is a battle of desires that is constantly at war within us. Let's not even just talk about relationship. Let's just talk about the thing that you're addicted to. Let's just talk the thing that you're obsessed with. Let's just talk about the cycle that you have found yourself in. There is a battle of desires waging war inside of me. And this is why God has given us this gift called discernment. Discernment. And it's your responsibility to have order when it comes to discernment and desire discernment must come before your desires because desire it has the ability to cloud your discernment it has the ability to cloud what God is trying to speak to you and your desire to be with someone it can cloud your vision when it comes to see what you are actually chasing it clouds your vision to be able to see the cost that you are actually spending right now and here's the deal is that desire it can lead you astray but when discernment comes before desire when it is in divine order what happens is that discernment begins to calculate new desires for you 
You no longer want the things that you used to want because you're now seeking God and you're now seeking the Holy Spirit. God, would you give me the vision to see what you see? Would you give me the eyes to see the battles that that person is fighting that maybe they're not willing to face and not willing to deal with and I don't want to take that with me because it's not a battle for me to fight? Would you give me discernment on the timing to pursue the person that I'm supposed to? It says actually in 1 Corinthians 2.14, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the spirit means. What this means is that if you are actively pursuing God and you're actively saying, you know what, God, I want you to be the center. I want you to be the start. I want you to be the foundation of my relationships. Then you cannot be with someone that does not consult God first. You cannot be with someone that does not know the love of a father because they will never know how to love you correctly. You need discernment to be able to see through the facade. Is this person truly who they say they are? Is their faith actually built on what they say it's built on? Or is this a facade to take me and to try to pull me in and to try to pursue me, but this won't last over time? You need discernment of the Holy Spirit. Discernment is not just like this good gut feeling. It's, it's a gift from the Holy Spirit that he's saying, get this in order and let me speak and let me show and let me reveal things that you can't see on the outside. Good. And let me say this. Let me say this. I, I've, I've shared it before and, and I flex it because this is my biggest flex in life. Okay. I don't have many other flexes, but this is, this is, my, one, this is my one flex that I have. I did, for me, this is just my story, and this is not everybody's story in the room. But maybe this is, but maybe it's not. For me, I asked God when I was real young, I said, God, how do you want me to date? And he said, I want you to date with my destiny in mind. Mm -hmm. I want you to date with my destiny, not, not to figure things out, not because you find somebody attractive, not because there's cool chemistry and sparks may fly and you're just trying to, I want you to date with your destiny in mind. And so, I didn't date anybody. I dated discerning, not desiring. My discernment was, I'm dating to reach the place that God has for me. So I ain't got time to waste. And, and here's what I learned, what I learned. Dating discerning instead of dating desiring, you cut out the time between. Meaning, there's a whole lot of time that I did not waste on relationships, on heartbreak, on deficit, on debt, because I would count the cost. Before I even built the house, I would count the cost. Well, could I see this person being a mother of my kids? Could I see myself coming to resolution through argument? This is what I would do at 16. I was weird, okay? <laughs> I was weird. I'm not saying this is how you should, this is how I do it. And people would always, they would always say, man, I, why don't you date that girl? It's just, dude, just do it. And I was like, no, because when I know is when God knows. And, 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 and when God knows, he'll reveal it to me and I'll say, bang, this is the time. Bang, bang, bang. So, so I stand here today saying, this girl right here, this girl is the only girl that I've ever dated. This girl that is the only girl I've ever pursued. She's my only baby mama. She's the only person I've ever engaged. She's my one and only wife. And it will be that way. And I'm not saying that's for you. I'm not saying that's for you. Here's what I'm saying. Is that we, we started dating. And then three months later, I asked her to marry me. And then like 45 days later, we got married. People are like, oh, that's fast. That dude, that's fast. That's you're right. It's not typical, but I don't, I don't think it's fast. I think when God says go, you go. <laughs> but but you can't you can't know when to go unless you have the gift of discernment. Yeah. See, it's the gift of discernment. Well, that seems irresponsible. Not when you're listening to God. No. It's not irresponsible when you do it God's way. <laughs> it's not irresponsible when 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 God becomes your greatest delight, not your own desires. Because I was like, God, like, bro, 
I'm marrying for two. I'm marrying for me and for you. So like, you're gonna have to like her just as much as I do. And, and she's gonna have to like you more than she even likes me. So I don't got time to waste buying hot tubs. <laughs> you can see I'm really upset about this hot tub. <laughs> I, I love what it says. We're going to close with this. We're going to close with this. It says this in Psalm 37, 4. It says, take delight in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. And then he will give you the desires of your heart. But, but we have to change from desiring to delighting. We have to go from desiring our will to delighting in God's will, even if it doesn't look like our will. Count the cost, because when you count the cost, it'll be worth every penny. Was this good for anybody today? I hope this was good for somebody. I hope you learned. I know this was so non-traditional, and next week we're going to have more preaching, and, um, but, but today we just really wanted to get this out, and we just want to pray over you and your future relationships or your current relationships your current marriages, wherever you're at, I believe this with all of my heart, that wherever you're at, whether you are single, <coughs> dating, engaged, married, married for a long time, I, I, I don't think that the principle ever stops, ever stops. I don't, it, it never stops. Take delight in the Lord. First and foremost, above all else, above all else, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and everything will flow from it. With every head bowed and every eye closed today, I just wanna pray for you and we're gonna dismiss and we'd love to hang out with you and talk with you in the lobby. But if you're here today and you would say, man, God, would you, would you give me a heart that delights after your heart and I've been desiring so many different things. Actually, I've been living in a deficit. I've been living with heartbreak or maybe you've been living in confusion or maybe you've been living in debt because you didn't build it the right way. We just wanna pray and encourage you today. If that's you, would you raise your hand, one, two, three, if that's you? Just, yeah, you're like, God, I just, God, would you encourage me? God, I pray right now that you would encourage them. Encourage them. Encourage them, Lord. God, that they would build wisely, that they would count the cost, Lord, before they start building, so that what you build in and through them, God, would withstand every single storm that is thrown their way, Lord. God, I pray that they wouldn't settle, God, but that they would raise the standard. God, that they would raise the standard, God, of who you've called them to be, of who you've called them to pursue, Lord. Have your way, God, in their life. Would they count the cost? And Pastor Witt's gonna lead us in a prayer of salvation today. Yeah, and if you're in this place and you've just never said yes to Jesus and you're hearing this whole thing about relationships and you don't have the one relationship that matters the most. And today you're saying, you know what, I wanna step into relationship with God and take my next step with him. If that's you with your hands raised around this room, one, two, three, I want you to raise your hand and say, God, you know what, I'm ready for my next step. I'm ready to step into relationship with you. Would everyone in this room just repeat after me, say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. I thank you for the opportunity to love in the way that you have loved me. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for me. I give my life to you, my whole future to you. Would you have your way in my life? In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.